हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल जितरंगा तब शुभ नामे जाने तब शुभ आशीष माने गाहे तब जय गाता जनगण मंगल Atmosphere. 
One of the first things we learned, my parents were very liberal in their thinking, and I'm very grateful for that. And even when we were young, you know, one of the first things my father always told me was, if you do anything, and you devote a large amount of time to doing something, and if you love doing that, do it well. If you do something as a part-time hobby, it's fun, then you can devote less time to it, but if it is something that you like doing and you love, do it well. Learn its culture, learn its history, learn its traditions, learn its technique, do it well. And this lesson has stuck with me right throughout my life, especially so in cricket. I was different to other cricketers in Sri Lanka growing up because I started late. I was never a born cricketer. I played tennis, I played badminton, I swam to school, I played table tennis. I did everything except play serious cricket when I was young. I seriously picked up cricket when I was about 17. I played at under 13 and 15 levels, it was never any good. Under 17, I was not any better. But for me, it was a case of choosing something that I liked. I can't say that I really loved it at that point. So at 17, here I was, trying to choose between tennis or cricket. I knew I was not going to be any good at tennis. And I wasn't sure I was going to be any good at cricket. But one thing that cricket offered me was a lot of fun and time to be with my friends because cricket was a team sport. So, rather by accident, rather than design, I chose to play cricket. And when I switched, to seriously concentrate on cricket, my father took over my coaching. He's been coaching me on and off since I was 13. He still coaches me now. And he took over my coaching. And I will tell you one thing. He was a great coach, but he made my life hell. <laughs> because I remember he used to come on weekends, 7 in the morning. And At about six, or at about seven in the morning, and check on me to see whether if I was awake. I would pretend to be asleep. He would call me a couple of times. I'd pretend to be asleep, and I didn't hear him. He'd walk away, come back 15 minutes later, check on me whether I was awake. I'd still pretend to be asleep. Then he'd send either my mother or someone else to try and wake me up, maybe with a cup of tea, maybe with the promise of you know a, a really nice breakfast. And the moment he heard my voice. He was in my room saying, up you get, it's already past seven, we're going to the backyard, it's time for your cricket. So from seven till about ten o'clock on a weekend, and I was a kid, you know, I should be out playing, having fun with my friends, till ten o'clock, I'd be outside in the backyard when my father would start throwing tennis balls at me for three hours. Breakfast? No breakfast until you get your whole defensive right. Well, it was not a threat, but it was just how seriously he took his time with me and how seriously he valued that time to produce a, a good result in my work. My father was an active lawyer, clients would come to see him at 8, my mother would be, could you please stop torturing the child, let him eat breakfast, the clients are here, he'd be saying, they're here to see me, they have to wait, I'm working with my son. In America, that would probably be cause for psychiatric help for me growing up. <laughs> But, the greatest lesson I learned from that is that nothing comes easy. Whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, whether you're growing up, there are certain things in life you have to do seriously. <clears throat> there is no substitute for hard work. You can be the most gifted child in your academic work, in your sports. But, if you don't work hard at it, you don't improve, you don't get better, you don't see the value of trying to realize your full potential. So for me, when I look back now to those memories, I realize they were the foundation, or they were the foundation stones of my entire life that I've led up to now. That is the base on which I have based 
everything I have done. My academic work. My father was so concerned about sport when I was young that I had the greatest joy of missing all my promotional exams till I was about 13 or 14. And that's unheard of. My mother would be panicking. Your son is not going to learn anything at school. But when I was about 13 or 14, and when I had to really seriously take my study work, both my parents insisted that I had balance, that I had enough time to work in my classroom, but I also spent a healthy amount of time away from the classroom learning to play sport. And remember once I was 17, I was playing, a, we have houses in, in schools, I think we have houses in, in, in all schools. So we had house cricket matches, and uh, you get to miss school when you play house cricket matches. So that was an added incentive to play, play cricket. So I was supposed to have a history class, and I was studying for my advanced levels exams. I, I was not a kid. It's the most boring class in the world, really. I used to remember falling asleep halfway through it, and uh, trying to fight to keep my eyes open. But I was playing cricket. I had cut my history class. I had just finished fielding. I was captaining the side. I look up towards our dressing room. And my mother is standing outside the door. Now, I'm scared. I'm scared of my mother, even now. Even now. If she tells me something, I do it. But at that time, it was terrifying. I was thinking, what have I done now? So I walked up. She looked at me and said, your history class started half an hour ago. Your master is waiting for you. I said, oh, I can't really make it today. Now, nah, you're going now. I had no choice. I could bar my head in shame, be led by my ear through my friends, all the guys who are watching me play cricket, captain of the side, led home to study in my history class. You know, that's a scarring experience. I couldn't live that down. I can't live it down. My school friends still remind me about that day. But, again, a good lesson for me, you know, sometimes we resist the action of our parents. Sometimes we rebel against it. I think Mark Twain was the one who said, when I was 16, I was embarrassed by my father. He knew nothing. And by 21, I was amazed at what he had learned in five years. <laughs> So your relationship with your parents, they change. Throughout the years, they change, they, they, they evolve. And you don't appreciate certain things at that time, but I look back now. Sometimes, as a child, I needed a push. Sometimes I needed a shove, maybe a smack, to try and get it into my head that there are certain things you have to do, certain responsibilities that you can't avoid. Not just to yourself, to your friends, to your family. And sometimes you learn it the easy way, sometimes you learn it the hard way. I learned it the hard way, which was my own fault. The first time I played, I watched a serious cricket match was in the 1996 World Cup. Sri Lanka were playing Kenya, and I went to a school that was fortunate. We're the only school in the world to have a test ground as our school ground, Asperia. So they played the cricket match there. So I went. I watched Sana Jai Suri, Aravinda Dissilva, and Asan Kaburisim smash a Kenyan attack. And I thought, now oh, this looks fantastic. Now I'm playing this sport. But now here are some guys who are playing it at such an advanced level. Is this something that I can maybe achieve one day? I went back home, still playing cricket. I was lucky to be selected to represent. Sri Lanka under 19 versus India under 19. We had Ajita Kaka who was, who was playing in that side. He's still playing cricket, he played for India. Uh, a few other players, some of them have, have not yet reached international uh, standard and played for India. Um, so I went through that series and I remember sitting at home and watching the World Cup Finals of 1996. And I watched a Sri Lankan cricket team achieve something that Sri Lanka never dreamed of. 1981, we got our test status in 1981. 15 years later, there were 11 players on the field who changed the course of Sri Lanka's history, who brought 
a divided country in some aspects, together through sport. They were an example on that screen of an ideal Sri Lankan society. Everyone, irrespective of religion, caste, creed, ethnicity, who cares? Eleven cricketers who belong to the entirety of Sri Lanka, belong to every single Sri Lanka, 20 million plus of Sri Lankans, embracing those cricketers, cheering them on, wanting them to win. And they did. I sat there and I watched it and I thought, oh, this is something I would love to do. To be able to inspire kids, to be able to inspire 85-year-old grandmothers who sit by TVs, touch the TVs and pray. What better position to be in? What more can you want out of life? I got into university. But because of certain civil problems in Sri Lanka, universities were closed for two years. I had to wait two years after gaining interest to actually read my first year in law. And again, happy chance, luck, good fortune, destiny, call it what you will. I spent those two years playing cricket. I worked within those two years for a company called Informatics. And the head of my department was a gentleman called Brendan Group, who was a national cricketer, first person to score double century, the first cricket keeper to play a score double century, probably the first cricketing, test cricket in Sri Lanka to score double century, which he did against New Zealand. My first salary at that time was 4,500 Sri Lankan rupees, which in Indian terms nowadays would mean just under 2,000 or maybe 2,000 rupees. That was great, that was like a fortune to me. So, here I was, a young kid, working, playing cricket. Managed to have a good season. Was into the A side. Was into the national side. Now, I had a decision to make. I had read my first and second years in law. Just got into the national side. What do I do? I go to the university authorities. I ask them, is it possible? to try and balance both. And of course you can. If you cover 60% of your lectures, you can sit your exam. If you don't, you can play cricket. No exam. What do you do? I said, can I do both? This is an academic institution. Pick one. You're not able to play cricket. Not play cricket for the country? Ah, it doesn't work with us. This is about doing your law degree. Not about playing cricket. So I had a decision to make. And I had to pick cricket. There was no doubt in my mind at that time, be critical. If I can, I'll finish my law concurrently. So I chose cricket. And within my first six months, I had a great first debut series against South Africa and Pakistan, one day cricket. Within the first six months, I walked within the, not the first six, but the first three months of playing in the side, I was walking into places people were recognizing. They're coming up to say, hello, how are you? You play well. And that was a great feeling. You think you have achieved something. You think you're really good. Thank you. It's nice. <coughs> how do you enjoy playing good? It's really great. Fantastic. From there, within the first six months of playing cricket, there's one thing I realized. Number one, are you going to be popular as a new face? As a young kid breaking into a side? Are you going to be happy with being an okay cricketer who scores a few runs? Or, number three, the only choice I had, work, and work, and work, so that in my mind, I have no doubt that I can play this game at this level and have a permanent place in the national side. It took me six months to realize I was nowhere close to being a permanent member of the side. I was not consistent. I was not good enough. I was not working hard enough. I was not thinking of change. 
six months. It took me another eight months to work at correcting my technique. I'm trying to get better at wicket keeping so Murali can stop making a fool of me behind the stumps. <laughs> work so that when I walked on the field, when I ate at a restaurant, when I met people, that they recognized me for being the person who was not only good at cricket, but who also carried himself in a way that deserved the position of a Sri Lankan cricketer. Because in Sri Lanka, cricket is more than a sport. So it, so it is in India as well. But in Sri Lanka, I think, it's slightly different because we spent 30 years growing up in the context of the civil war. A war against, not civil war, sorry, a war against terrorism. A war that has touched every person's life since its beginning. A war that has divided opinion, polarized communities, and embraced very dangerous emotions. When we play cricket, which I quickly realized, of course, it was a reflection Normalcy. It was a. It was an example of normalcy in life. When there was a cricket match on, Sri Lanka seemed to stop. The war seemed to stop. Bombs exploding seemed to stop. People would forget their grief, forget the atrocities, forget that life was hard. And they would get together. They will look at each other and see a fellow Sri Lankan standing on either side of them, supporting a team of Sri Lankans. For us, the greatest joy we had was representing the entirety of Sri Lanka in the best manner possible. Cricket and the cricket team, we were the, the, the wonderful panacea that that healed all illnesses, all ills, all the wounds of society. They looked upon us with such adulation, such joy, such love, such support. And to the eternal credit of Sri Lankan predators, the one thing that it did was it made us extremely grateful and extremely humble. I look back upon the billions that watch cricket today. I look at the fans who come to support us. I look at the fans who brave weather, brave traffic, harsh conditions, to come and watch their teams play, be it IPL, be it international cricket, be it Sri Lanka, any, any country, any fan. It is a privilege for us to play in front of you. It is not our right to play. This game does not belong to us. We do not own it. We are transients. We move in and out of this game. One player goes, another one takes his place. But it is a privilege that is afforded to us by you, the fan. If it were not for you, we are nothing. We are entertainers. Simply, we are entertainers. We exist because of the fact. The lifestyles we lead, the money we make, everything is because of the fact. And that's the first realization I think any cricketer must have. Because that is the only way you are going to value yourself and this profession we are in. The fan. And the moment you understand that, you come to another realization. You have a responsibility towards them. Number one, to be the best that you can be as a cricketer and as a person. <coughs> To cultivate your character, to educate yourself, not just in the ways of the game, 
but also in life. So that people are proud to not only have you representing them on the field, but off the field as well. That young kids looking up to you, they look up to you with pride. You inspire them. In South Africa, post apartheid, they have a quota system in their in their in their, in their cricket where they you have to have four players of, of color in the team. That caused a great deal of debate. Even within our team. How can they have just have a rule saying four players of color? Isn't that unfair? Won't they get picked even if they're not good? And these discussions were going on, and I had a discussion with the former manager of the South African team, and he told me one thing. He said, the majority of the South African population is black. They are poor. If we want these kids to be inspired by sport to break this vicious cycle of poverty and to be inspired to better themselves, they need to have role models they can relate to. They need to have people like them on the big screen playing for them so they look at them and say, I can be like him. We don't have those issues in Asia. They're all the same color. Shades lighter, shades darker maybe. But for us, it is the same thing, isn't it? We want people, children, young adults, anyone to look up at, look up at us and say, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. To be in a position to inspire another generation. It's a great, it's a position of great power. It's a position that you can abuse. It's a position that leads you down questionable paths. If you're not strong enough, if you're not smart enough, if you don't have a good base, you see that happening various instances in cricket or in sport. Which brings me to my next point, balance. In life. I think it would be terrible if I'm going to end my life being known as a cricketer. Just a cricketer. It's a great privilege, trust me. I love the fame. But is that who I am? Is that all that I am? Just a cricketer. They want to look back in, in a few years' time, or many years' time, and say, oh, I was a great cricketer. That is only one part of my life. What about the rest? Cricketers have an expiry date. You basically spend huge part of our most productive period of our life playing this game, not really concentrating on anything else. <coughs> and trust me, you might not believe this, but the financial rewards of playing cricket, if you're playing only for your country, especially in the Sri Lankan sense, will not allow you to retire for life. <laughs> you finish your cricket, you retire from the cricket, then you start living real life. You find a real job you come back to the real world. You're not going to be living in, in, in five-star hotels, flying business class, getting everything done for you for the rest of your life. That's a scary thought. The rest of your life is much longer than your cricketing career. Your responsibilities are many, not just to yourself. If you're married, if you have children, if you're supporting other dependents, how is that going to continue? What are you going to do? In Sri Lanka, we've had a lot of young players coming in over the years. And one thing that I have seen is there is a great danger in a young player who's not mature, who's not worldly. There's a problem, there's a danger in how he deals with his finances, his fame, his popularity, the opportunities that he has. A lot of the times we see role reversals in households. You see the parents being the breadwinners of the family, suddenly their child is playing for Sri Lanka or for any country. 
king becomes the main or the biggest earner in the household, he suddenly takes on the role of being the parent. The father will sit on the floor while the son sits on the chair. Someone comes home, the father or the mother will be making a cup of tea for your old friends. Because suddenly, there is no balance. There is no one to tell him no. The parents or the brothers or the elders will be afraid to say, oh, don't do that, that's not right. Maybe their decision was wrong. Maybe there's something better that you can do because they're afraid. The sun is an icon. The sun is larger than life. We encourage Sri Lankan players, especially when they're young. Number one, if you're coming to Colombo because like cricket is centered in Colombo, bring your parents with you. Don't live alone. Spend as much time, at least get them to visit you as often as possible. Make sure that the first thing you do with your money is you save it. Build a house. Invest it. Take care of your parents, your family. Because we have a responsibility as senior players, as players who have played a longer time, to ensure that the younger generation is led by example. And that responsibility is ours. I have spoken to the cricket board in Sri Lanka for many years, asking them, please, is it possible for us to insist when a national player signs a contract to bind them to finish a course of study or a course which enables him to pursue a profession once that career is over? Can we have a career guidance counselor coming with the team, talking to players about what they wanted to do after cricket? What do you want to do? It's a scary thought. If we have the ability to educate cricketers, because we spend a lot of time dumbing ourselves. We play a lot of cricket. If it rains, we spend eight hours at the ground waiting to play. Sometimes we don't get back on the ground. We do nothing with our time. We have a responsibility as cricketers, as administrators to ensure that these cricketers have something apart from just their cricket. I heard a lot of people say, oh, to get better at cricket, you have to eat, drink, sleep cricket 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I'll tell you, if you do that, you will never be good at it. If your entire life you spend being obsessed with one thing, it is not healthy. It's not healthy for us cricketers. We need time away. We need to have healthy relationships off the field, especially with our family and friends. You need to have wholesome relationships away from the field. You need to be able to go back in times of trouble, in times of joy, in times of sorrow, and have a support system that benefits you. Same friends that you were at school with, they are the people who know who you are. Not the new friend who comes after you're popular. Your parents, your siblings, they love you no matter what. Whether you're a great cricketer or if you're a nothing. You're still their son. Have those healthy relationships because they are what adds value to your life. Not the million dollars you earn in the IPL. It's not the 10,000 runs you score. It is having a base that is supportive, that is full of love, and that enables you to get better. In Sri Lankan selection meetings, I've heard a lot of them use the word potential. Every one of you, you have immense potential. Immense. But, we have selected players on just their potential and talent. I have seen the most amazingly, amazingly talented cricketers not play more than three test matches or one test match or three one days for my country. Talented potential is a great starting point. Doesn't get you very far. 
If you do not couple it with hard work, you will not get far. If you do not realize, you look at anyone, not just cricket, you look at any profession. Every day is about work. Every day is about getting better. Every day is about better relationships with your team, with your co-workers, with your business partners, analyzing your competition, trying to find ways of bettering yourself, your product, your knowledge base. Isn't that what we all fight for every day? In everything? To get better? If you do not work hard, you do not get better. In cricket, we are used to receiving love, adulation, and praise. But we are very bad at receiving criticism. We are very, very weak as cricketers as a whole in being questioned, in being told that we are wrong, in being told that we are not good enough. Some people find it very hard to deal with. I've seen players in my side. They have one bad newspaper article written about them. They will spend a week with a glum face. They have one article of praise. They're over the moon. They think, oh my God. What does cricket really teach you? If you really examine it, what does it teach you? It teaches what? Hard work. Teamwork. Teamwork. That's a great point. Teamwork. The Ringelman effect. If you're in a tug of war with a rope, you have two people tugging at opposite ends of the rope. You add two more people, you expect the force to double. You add more, the force should be great. Actually, the force is reduced. In teamwork. Cricket is an individual team sport. Out in the middle when you're batting, there's only two. Not 11, there's only two. One running, one facing the delivery. When you're bowling the ball, one person is supported by 10 others on the field, yes, but the responsibility of bowling that is yours. You're a fielder. Your responsibility to catch that ball, get that run out, stop that boundary. Cricket within the team, individual performance matters. Sometimes we misunderstand this word team. Team may think oh, everyone gets on like one big family. I'm sorry to disappoint you, no. Sometimes you play with players you do not like. You got you are angry with, you have arguments with, you fight. In any family. That happens. That is how you grow. If I ever walk into a selection meeting and everyone is in agreement, there is something wrong there. <laughs> there has to be arguments. There has to be someone to say no. Someone with a different opinion. Teamwork. Teamwork comes when you cross that boundary line. You commit 100% to your team strategy. Consider you, you commit 100% to your teammates and you commit 100% to giving all your energy out on that field for the team. You ever heard the, the phrase everyone loves to use? Oh, he gave 200%, he gave 110%, he gave 150%. There is no bigger number than 100%. I think. Isn't that all you can give? 100%? You can't suddenly become superhuman and Finally, increase your productivity by, I don't know, another hundred percent. There are some days you can give only eighty percent. There are some days where you can give only sixty percent. There are some days something's bothering you emotionally, physically, something. But if it's eighty percent that you can give, give a hundred percent of that eighty. Give all eighty percent. Give everything you have. That is the idea of teamwork. You look at your teammate and you know he's as good enough as anyone to be by your side. You see them working in practice. You 
you see how hard they work. If you're good, and you think you're good, and you cruise, you cruise downwards, you don't improve. That is the importance of practice. In practice, one of the greatest things you do is number one, create confidence in yourself by doing everything you possibly can to be prepared for the game or for your exam or whatever it is that, that, that the challenge that is facing you. Number two, you create confidence in the team because they see you working hard. So they know that you are doing everything that you possibly can to be the best member of that team. So it creates confidence, it creates trust. Trust in your own ability, in your teammates' ability. Trust within the team of being able to beat an opposition, of being able to face a challenge. What else? Discipline? <coughs> Discipline. It's a combination of all of that, isn't it? Discipline. It's not just about going to sleep at 10 o'clock, eating your big breakfast at, at 11, getting to the bus at time. Those are only parts. It's a whole bigger picture when it comes to discipline. Sometimes we simplify discipline by saying, oh, there's curfew at midnight, be there. Yeah, there is discipline to try and adhere to it. There are some people who are different. How boring is it if there were 11 people in the team and all of them were the same? I would hate to be in that team. Individuality. What cricket teaches you along with discipline this is something that's connected is individuality. The value of being an individual, of being different, of being one out of the many, not one of the many. Cricket teaches you to accept individuality, I think the good sides do. If you value individuality, you will be more tolerant, more accepting, and better as a team. Lasset Malika is a great point. Murlidharan is a great point. If we did not have them, the Jai Suryas, the De Silvas, the Ranatunga, Ranatunga was fat. He's not your ideal cricketer, but what a cricketer he was. In the modern, modern day, when we stress so much on fitness, imagine if he lost an Arjuna Ranatunga, or an Aravinda De Silva, or an Asantu Guru Singha. They were not the fittest cricketers, but what great cricketers were they? We must learn to accept that. Man management. Being a captain is not about making decisions on the field. That's the easiest part. Being a coach, strategizing, easiest part. It's about how you deal with 15 different players, get them to commit to one goal, and have allowances for certain players that enable them to function at their best. To create an environment which nurtures free spirit of thinking, individuality, but at the end of the day, is discipline and is a team. It's a tough job. Not just in cricket, in any, in any workplace. Individuality. In the Sri Lankan dressing room, one of the greatest things I'm grateful for, we have no egos. We have no egos. As the rural Dharan is like a big kid. Spends all his time with the youngest players of the side, bringing them dinner, making, you know, joking with them, going out for dinner with them. Son of Jasurya, Lasit Malinka, Maya Jarabodhan, all these guys, they have no egos. It's an amazing thing to see. These amazing world class cricketers are so secure in their own abilities, in their own selves, that they don't need to project an arrogance. They don't need to project overconfidence. They don't need to abuse the opposition. They smile. Masit Malinga gets hit for a four. Have you seen him in the IPL? Gets hit for a six. What does he do? He smiles. Doesn't abuse the player because Masit knows he's the best in the world at what he does. If a batsman hits him, 
good shot. So cricket teaches discipline, self-discipline, discipline within a team, the discipline to be tolerant and accepting, the discipline to value your opinion, to trust your opinion, and to be able to express it freely in a team environment. In our dressing room, you could be the greatest player in the world, or you could be making your debut. Both of you have the same right to talk. Your opinions are valued the same way. What great life lessons these are. But, if these lessons are only used by us for the brief time we play this game, what use is it to us? What use is it to our communities? These are the same qualities that you take with you when you leave the game. These are the values that when you finish, your name is no longer in the headlines. And trust me, when you are a non-entity once you retire, when you are a non-entity when you retire, the leaders become non-entities when they retire. Maybe Sachin will be an exception. <laughs> Few of the other greatest players in the world may be an exception. But for a lot of us, it's a stark reality. We are nothing when we retire unless we use these lessons, we, learn, we use this time in the limelight to create something for ourselves away from this game. The highest suicide rate among sportsmen is in cricket. The highest suicide rate in sportsmen is in cricket. Why do some cricketers play for so long? Is there some are just good? Granted. But then there are some who are afraid to let go. They are scared to face an uncertain future. Who is going to employ a cricketer once he stops playing cricket? No one, unless he is qualified to do a job. Very few of us are. <laughs> what are we going to do? We can't play cricket when we are 50. Who's going to give us that opportunity? All the doors that open to us. Snap on the fingers tomorrow. What do you want? I want biryani for lunch with something from this country and that country. Done. There you go. You retire. Get it yourself. These are serious things cricketers have to face. If we are lucky enough to have a great career and we have the means to support ourselves, the one thing we must always never forget is the value of the people who come and watch us and support us. Cricket and life. You gave us life as cricketers. You gave us opportunity and means. How do we give back? What do we do to give back? few ways, play the game, play it as well as you can, be the best that you can be, live your life to your best ability, be an example, be an inspiration, help everyone that you can, give back, give back a part of yourself, your time, not just your money, some people don't care for your money, but they will value your time, they will value your presence, when you sign an autograph, when you take a picture, it's not about being on the cell phone, signing something, looking away, not looking at the camera when someone's taking a photo. It's about spending that two or three seconds required looking that person in the eye, smiling, shaking his hand. That they might value more than your autograph. The lessons we learn in life. I hate it when a cricketer does not have the time to put down his cell phone to talk to someone. Or at least say, excuse me, I'm on the phone, can you give me five minutes? Or to sell the call, I'll call you back. Spend that time. There are lessons for cricketers in 
everything that we do. And these lessons and what we do, this is life. Cricket is a game. It is not life. But it gives you a great foundation to live your life to the fullest. Education is the same. Your profession is the same. It is not your life. But what it does is it enriches your life. It makes you more than you thought you could be. Remember one thing in whatever you do. This is my maxim in life. Not my maxim. Oscar Wilde. A favorite author. One thing he said. The artist must at all times educate the critic. The artist must educate the critic. We are all artists. We all have our critics. We are all artists. Luck, good fortune, chance, destiny. It's in your hands. No one else's. To the largest extent, your decisions, your learning of these lessons of life, your family, your relationships, this is what enables you to forge your own path, to forge your own destiny. It will teach you discipline. It will teach you teamwork. It will teach you commitment, sacrifice. It is yours to learn it. It is yours to imbibe. It is yours to take it in and change your life and the others around you. Because when you change, people around you change. Just make sure it's in a good way, it's in a positive way. The artist must at all times educate the critic. Everywhere you look, everything that you do is an opportunity for this. The harder you work, the less luck you need. The better decisions you make, the less luck you need. The greatest life lesson I have learned through cricket you are the captain of your own ship. And that is much harder than captaining a side. Captaining yourself. Being a leader, everyone is a leader. It doesn't have to be a nominated leader. Everyone's a leader. From the youngest child to the oldest, they're all leading. They're leading themselves more often than not. For cricket and for life, what I have had, I'm greatly thankful. I'm thankful for your time here. And most of all, I am thankful that I have the opportunity to learn these concepts and even the greater fortune to be able to come here and share them with you. Thank you. What an inspiring life and what an inspiring life. What a, what a thank you very much. When we said Kumara Sangapura is coming to Manthan, some people asked us, what's a cricketer going to do at Manthan? <laughs> Manthan is all about intellectual discourse uh, on issues of which concern and interest all of us. Today I was we were all proven right why Kumar Sangakkara alone amongst the cricketers can come here. I am equally happy today that we have so many, so many youngsters who have come. They thought they will come and meet their, their star, their uh, someone they adore so much. But what I am happy about is the fact that they came and heard this wonderfully inspiring talk.
I, I, with his permission, I would like to put this talk up for uh, download, and then you could all come and listen to it uh, as often as you can and uh, be inspired by it. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Shall we take a few questions? Yes, yes. Please. Yeah, I would yeah. like to. Uh... Children first. Okay. <laughs> Please. Will some child move this mic? Yeah. Yeah. Come. Uh, one of our guys here will know how to do it better. Yeah. Give it to children, please. Would you like to sit down? No, I'm fine, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank I'm You do one thing, make up your, frame your question, the mic will come back to you, okay? What do you want to know about that? That's a tough question. I'm uh, being very honest with you. I am still undecided. I've spent some time with my wife and my family talking about it, with my manager talking about it. So we've come up with a few plans. Um, and uh, I hope they work. Uh, but it will be an interesting time. There are lots of options that, that I have. So I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive answer at this moment. But hopefully within the next year, I'll have made my decisions and have that pace that I wanted. Uh, I want to when I retire so that I have something that I can meaningfully do. Why I'm not doing my wicket keeping? It's because Pathi Patel is a wicket keeper. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a good question actually because this was asked by some of the reporters and some commentators as well. Um, it's because Pathi uh, many joined Deccan. Uh, you know, it was, I, I thought I was, I was going to keep, but part had a discussion with me and he said he would like to keep because he's not so sure of himself in the field. So sometimes, I started my career as a keeper, but then I have fielded as well. So sometimes for the sake of your, your team, you have to make a decision and you make that decision uh, for the betterment of your side and part his performance behind the stumps have, has been excellent. So I'm very happy that he has been keeping. Um, and it's something that I have to do uh, and make a decision about. Yeah, yeah. How would you want to encourage your team to play better? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's really the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, it's 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 hard to give you one particular answer because you see, different people are motivated by different things. You know, you can't fault someone for being motivated by something different you. Some are motivated by the, the, the happiness or the, the, you know, the smile that you, that you have when you win. Some are inspired by trying to be the best that they can be by bowling or batting or someone who must be the best field. Uh, some are motivated by money. That's not wrong. That is not wrong. Some are motivated by finances to go and play and play their best. Everyone gets motivated in different ways. The, the, the trick is to find a balance and an approach that appeals to everyone. So we've been working very hard behind the scenes to try and come up with that. And we've, we've tried a lot of different things. And sometimes in cricket, the inspiration is not the real question. It's the execution that comes into question. In cricket, there is never a right or wrong decision. You can select your team, you can win the toss, lose the toss, you can win the toss and bat. You can do whatever you want, you can bowl this particular ball at this particular time, you can make the right decision at the right time, but if the execution fails, the result is not going to be good. So sometimes, the decision making, the inspiration has to be tied with execution of bowling that ball in the right spot, of playing the right shot for the right moment, of taking the right option, and holding a catch, simple thing like that sometimes. So we're trying our best to train hard, to motivate the people, but I think where we have failed this season is not any of that. I have never met a bunch of guys who want harder, you know, 
statement to win this much than I have at Tetan Charger. But we have failed in execution. At crucial times, our execution has been found wrong. How to overcome? How to overcome tough situations in a match? Well, I think the first thing is preparation before a match. The preparation before the match gives you the confidence to deal with those tough situations. Um, you know, you've heard a lot of the sides say, if you're, even if you're number one in the world, you always train as if you're number two or number three, as if you're chasing the number one spot. So training yourself and going out of your comfort zone plays a big part in your being able to handle tough situations in matches. So at training, you do the really hard things, so matches, those situations become easier for you. Also, you need to really have great belief in yourself, in your ability, and there must be a lot of support from your team. Those are the most important factors for you to be able to make a clear decision when that tough situation arises. What are you What are you now? Well, I, I am a, a batsman most of the time. We can keep us sometimes, and sometimes a very clumsy fielder. No bowling. I bowled a couple of balls and they were very bad. <laughs> yeah. A vice DHK in North India since the last two months. Sorry? A vice DHK in North India. Well, Dale Stain had a small accident with his foot. Um, he was very uh, angry at himself for, for a particular over that he bowled and he kicked uh, uh, an empty <laughs> box and he kicked the next box which he thought was empty but turned out to be full of water, <laughs> uh, full of bottles of water and unfortunately he did some damage to his foot which kept him out for about two games. And that is a true story by the way. Do you like more home ground or away? Um, there is no greater honor than playing in your home ground. Because that is why, you know, that, that is the beauty of having a home ground. You have to play at your home ground. Um, I think it, it's great to have one home ground uh, rather than many home grounds. I'm a great fan of playing in front of, of, this, of the franchise, the city that you're playing for. So we have a great stadium in Hyderabad, fantastic people. So I think there's no better place than playing in Hyderabad. What's it like for uh, playing while playing cricket? My diet. <laughs> oh, what I eat? What I eat? Yeah, what's oh. the diet for you? Well, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I eat a lot of things. Uh, I eat all kinds of food. I'm lucky I don't put on too much weight. Um, the thing is, it's, it's to, to be mindful of what you eat. So we have, you know, you can eat a lot of carbohydrates for energy. You need meat for, for, your, change, yeah. uh, for, for you know, muscle building. If you're a vegetarian, you'll have certain different kinds of vegetables that you eat uh, for various things. So it's a combination of things. But once in a while, I do eat things that are really frowned upon, like fried food and you know, Chinese food and things like that. But as long as I'm not doing any harm to my body and to my performance on a regular basis, then you're okay with what you eat. But just eat, I think, if food in After India is a question or two, we'll move a little on. How many sit do you do? How many, many sit-ups do you do every day? <laughs> I don't do many sit-ups every day, but we, I go to gym three times a week. Uh, we have personalized training schedules for, for ourselves, so that which our trainer gives us. So you do running work, you do weights, you do sit-ups, you do various other exercises. So it's a combination of stuff. Okay. I, I think... I think yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether I've had that name. This is the first time I'm hearing it. My nickname is Sangha. <laughs> well, that, this is the first time I'm hearing, but I must ask to make that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't. don't yeah. Uh, really? No. I, I've seen that, I think, on the on the advert, but I'm not sure how I got that. Your question. You were rated as the current best player by the Western. How were you feeling? What were you feeling? Well, it's a, it's a great honor. Uh, I feel very humble and very privileged. And um, I'm just happy that I had a, a great year in cricket and scored the runs um, and also carried myself in a way that enabled me to be named that. Do you think uh, Test cricket will die in the next 10 years? No. <laughs> Definitely not. We'll take one question before I think, last. I think there are lots of people who like to think that Test cricket is dying. Uh, unfortunately, maybe Test cricket has not become viable uh, for, because of the financial necessities. But I think 
the, the, the popularity of T20 cricket in one way is a great vehicle to use to sustain test cricket. Without test cricket, I think it's no use playing any, any other format of the game. Test cricket should always be protected as the prime format of cricket. And again, as I said before, it's the responsibility of players to ensure that they play test cricket as much as possible. The administrators have to ensure that they don't play these two test series, and a test series is a minimum of three tests. And at the same time, they have to find ways of encouraging families to come and watch test cricket, especially facilities at grounds, so that the parents can bring their children and you know ensure that the children are also occupied during the time they want to spend at cricket. Because you need children, you need more and more people to come and watch test cricket. So it's going to be a tough road, but I think test cricket will always be the number one format. one question. Of course, I love cricket from the age of six, uh, five or six years, no doubt about it. Uh, do you have any cricket academy like that, like just, just like a tennis academy? Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have something, uh, you know, if you go for tennis, you know, the Nick Polanyi Tennis Academy in the US, you know, so many great tennis players have come from there. Uh, you have national cricket academies, and then you have various other private cricket academies. I think what you really need to do is is to tie them up where there is a, there's knowledge sharing, there's sharing of experience and expertise. And I think uh, cricket academies and, and properly governed cricketing schools are essential for the growth of cricket in any country. Uh, but at the same time, I think one thing you have to do very careful of is producing very similar cricketers and you must allow people with different abilities like Ajanta Mendes, like Lasit Malinga, like Murali also to come through these academies and not try to contain them and make them normal, regular cricketers. So academies are very important but I think we can do a lot more by having better ones. If I invite you over, if I open the invitation to join for lunch tomorrow, are you free? Tomorrow, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not free tomorrow, but uh, I won't be able to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Friends, I think uh, Sanda has to go for an event. Uh, we should close it now. I know there are a hundred more questions waiting. There's a lady there. There's one lady who wanted to, Sangamitra, you wanted to ask a question. He's inviting you to do that. Why don't you shout it out from there? Make it quick, Sangamitra. Um, I wanted to say this, that, see, every time I've heard you speaking on the television, I was always impressed by the way you speak. And uh, you're a marvelous cricketer, but such a marvelous speaker. And I have come here today, especially to hear you live, because you're such a wonderful speaker. And let me tell you, whatever you may select for a career after your retirement, one thing you have to do, you have to meet people like this and inspire them. Because the way you speak, it's absolutely out of the world. And I only hope some of the wonderful things you spoke today, I hope the children here have understood and at least picked up some of what you said. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much for being here.